Good morning. Good morning. Did everybody have a Merry Christmas? Yes. yes. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> time I ever lose my voice is Sunday morning. <clears throat> um, a couple thank yous that I want to give really quickly. Uh, Steve and Angie, thank you for so consistently leading worship, for being so faithful. Uh, I love that I can put a message together throughout the course of the week and I never, ever say anything to Steve or Angie and they always have appropriate music. And, and oftentimes, my message is preached in the worship before I ever get a chance to say anything. And that, that is A-OK -okay with me. Um, so thank you guys very much for all that you do. Um, <clears throat> Joe is out sick today, but I want to express a huge thank you to Joe for organizing the Sunday school. Uh, that is not an easy task, um, you know, with, with having a volunteer staff and having more classes open each week than we oftentimes have volunteers for. She does an incredible job making sure everything is taken care of. So when you see Joe, first stand at a distance and make sure you don't catch what she has. <laughs> and then when you find out she's okay and not contagious, give her a hug and say thank you very much for all that you do. Um, I have an Ask the Pastor question that I've actually had for, for probably about a month now. And uh, I feel really badly because the, the person that asked the question is my son. And he asked me last night, so dad, are you uh, going to get to my ask the pastor question? <laughs> yes, eventually. Um, the question is, I have heard it said that salvation once gained cannot be lost. How is this reconciled with Matthew 13, 20 and 21? Um, I'm going to flip over there. You don't have to go there. You can if you want. Um, this is the parable of the sower and the seeds. Um, so, Matthew chapter 13. I'm actually going to read um, the verses around it. This is the explanation of the, the parable. Okay? And Jesus says, um, here then, I'm starting in verse 18. Excuse me. <clears throat> Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Um, first, to, to answer this question, I don't believe that the first three examples were saved. Okay? They were not Christians. They were posers. Okay? Um, the, the first case, they receive the word, but they don't get it. We see this a lot. They, 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 they don't understand what you're talking. It's almost like you're speaking a different language. And you can see the kind of glazed look on their eyes where the devil is just stopping up their ears and they, they don't get it, okay? The second one, they receive it with joy. I've seen this a lot of times. Somebody has something going on, usually there's a crisis in their life and they see an answer, they see an out. They don't see the cost. And quite honestly, a lot of that is our fault as a church because... We bake this pretty cake and call it Christianity and give it to them, and they don't understand that they've got to eat the vegetables too. In order to be healthy, you need a balanced diet. And we've, we've painted this 
grotesquely inappropriate picture of Christianity. Come to Christ and all your problems will be solved. You'll have wealth and riches and be fabulously famous and loved by everybody. I can't find that anywhere in here. Okay? So, but honestly, that's kind of what we present to a lot of people. And then when they come to Christ and they're, they're saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this thing out. They're not doing it with understanding, are they? Because Jesus says that we have to consider the cost. What does it cost to be a Christian? Everything. You have to give up you. Okay? Now, the cost to you for salvation, really, it, it is nothing and it is everything. Because he's already done all the work. All you have to do is embrace it and then allow him to take you away. Not like Calvin. <coughs> all right? He's taking you away and making you something new, something better. Okay? So then the, the third one, um, this is the one sown among the thorns. Um, he hears the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Boy, that describes a lot of us in the United States. Pursuing the almighty dollar. You know, if I had just a little bit more, you'd ruin it just like you had when you had a little less. As your income increases, you increase your bills. That's the American way. So we're always living hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck. Okay? They're pursuing the American dream without understanding. You look at the men that, that built financial wealth. They did it on principles. They didn't do it by luck and happenstance. You look at the lottery. Did you know that 70% of people that win the lottery within a span of, I think what they say is like five years, have nothing? They blow it. Oh, if I could just have a million dollars. You... you <laughs> and it'd be gone okay if you're not faithful with the income you get in a year what makes you think you'll be faithful with a million <clears throat> so they they uh, the word proves unfruitful in their lives now the first one obviously there, there's no even glimmer of a Christian there but the second and the third one, that, that kind of looks like at some point they had at least an appearance of Christianity. But what does Jesus say about Christians? The ones that will be saved are those that endure to the end. Okay? That's not to tell you that you're not a Christian now, but if you are a Christian now, you will endure to the end. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, oh, you're God. You're saying that that I have to go through hardship. Yeah. yeah. You're saying it's going to be tough. Yeah. yeah. But I'm also telling you that you have someone that has taken you in his hand and is holding you firmly and will see you through all of it. Okay. But if you try and pose, you try and be the religious person. And, and do the things that a Christian should in your own power, when trials come upon you, you're going to fall. When you take off pursuing your own agenda, you're going to fall. Those that fall were never hits. Okay? I honestly, I cannot believe that you can gain something so freely that you have no power to control and then lose it. Whom God takes in his hand, nothing can shake free, not even you. Okay? So, to answer the question, um, the, the four examples, one was never a Christian, that was pretty obvious. The word came forth and they went, la 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 la, not this thing. Okay? Second one went, oh, this sounds great. Oh, wait, whoa, 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 what do you mean it's hard? Third one went, I really like this money. Choom. Jesus addressed those people in a different way, didn't he? He said that you cannot serve both God and money because you will love one and despise the other. Okay? So 
those three cases never were Christian. Okay? I've been seeing a lot of these things on, on Facebook, these little costumes that they put on dogs. And, and I, I saw one the other day that was fantastic. They, they put this little costume on a dog and it was the dog and his front paws and then little arms reaching behind it and holding a present and the back legs were another dog with arms holding the present. So it looked like two dogs carrying a present. I thought, oh, that's fantastic. But you know what? There was only one dog. And I don't care how you dress up that one dog. All it's ever going to be is a dog. Okay? And if you are dressing yourself up as a Christian, and you're not a Christian, you can, you can pose all you want. You can say the right words. You can wear the right clothes. You can read the right Bible. You can hang out with the right people. But when you stand before him, he will tell you, I don't know you. I have never known you. Okay? So, that's the short answer. So, Satch, that's for you. Um, again, if you have any questions, theological, doctrinal, just how does this work? You know, write them out for me. The questionnaires are over on the credenza. Put them in the box or just hand them to me. You, if you don't want me to read them out loud, just just write, you know, just please write your response. Don't embarrass me. You know, I, 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 I try not to embarrass anybody but my family. <laughs> and I, I've been embarrassing them from day one. That's just the nature of the beast. So thankfully I have family that's as embarrassing as I am. So Christmas is over. Is it? No. Oh. How many of you have taken down your decorations? <laughs> what? Uh, ah. Christy made me wait till yesterday. <laughs> I was I was cleaning up the wrapping paper and putting it in trash and I'm trying to like take things off the shelf and she's like, ah, 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 Saturday. You gotta leave them up till Saturday. I like my life. Everything in its place. I have a rule. Actually, there's one rule in our family, but there's a million subsets of that rule. Okay? One of the rules is if you borrow my keys, it goes in one of two places when you're done with it. What are they? In your hand or in your box. In my hand or in my box. Don't put them somewhere else. Because I have no idea where you keep your stuff. Okay, so when somebody needs my keys, well, actually, Josh's key, because I'm driving his car. <laughs> if Christy needs to go start the vehicle, when she's done, it comes in my hand or in my box where I keep my keys. So if I reach in my pocket and go, I don't have my key. Well, I don't have Josh's key. I know where to look. It should be in my box, okay? I like my life. Normal. I like Christmas stuff. When Christmas is done, I want it packed up, put in a box, and put away. But, but, has anyone kept track of the wise men? Where are they? Over there. Where did the wise men start? Back there. Back there. Where did they move to? There. Up here. Now they're over there. Real quick. When did the wise men come? at least somewhere in the span of two years, okay? Because a star appeared two years prior to their arrival. When the wise men showed up, how many were there? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. It says there were three gifts, but it doesn't tell us how many wise guys there were. You know? And, and, and tradition, uh, man, they came up with these names. Uh, I don't know where they got them. Okay? And I don't know why they stopped at three. But the wise men didn't show up. So we've been moving the wise men on their journey. Unfortunately, our... Jesus isn't growing up. He's not. No, he's stuck. 
and and our 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 house is on the east, and our guys have been coming from the west. But they'll understand kind of the journey. All right. Um, the wise men didn't show up right before or after the shepherds. As a matter of fact, Scripture makes it plain to us they were living in a house at that point. Okay, they weren't in the the, the Jesus wasn't in the manger. They didn't have this cute little thing with, you know, gray-haired Joseph. Why is Joseph always with gray hair? It's his first child. And we know they had numerous children after that. Wow. It's like Benj and Shay. <laughs> awesome. Why? I mean, I understand now because my children went through puberty. And it, it fades to transparency. <laughs> but I mean, this was his first child, and 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 the clothes that they're wearing, all these flowing garments and their beautiful colors, and this, oh, phooey. That's not how it happened. So, let's get to the word today. <clears throat> I'm going to bounce around um, real quick before we start. Next. Sunday. <clears throat> Next Sunday we will do our 2015 in review. And I always take the first Sunday of the, the year and we kind of focus on what happened in the previous year and what we're looking to in the coming year. And I always open the floor so you can share with us what God has done for you, with you, through you in the previous year. So start making plans. What has God, has God done something incredible to you in 2015? If the answer is no, come talk to me, please. I want to know where you've been hiding, okay? If God has done stuff with, for, or through you in 2015, we want to hear about it. We want to see all the ways that God moved. I'll do a year in review and, and, and kind of kick, pick out the highlights. But then we want to hear from you guys, all right? And then we're going to kind of look toward 2016, what's coming. So, um, right now, though, I want to talk about post-Christmas, okay? Now, it's a, it's a little bit different this year because most people got at least a three-day weekend. You know, a lot of people got a four-day weekend. They got Christmas Eve and then Christmas Day and then Saturday and Sunday. Okay, so Monday is really when the letdown seems to happen because everybody's got to go back to work and life kind of resumes. Um, although it's, it's not quite bad because you're going to get a day off as New Year's comes in most cases. And then the following Monday, things really just get back to the humdrum, don't they? And then it's kind of like this. Back to the grind. Back to the routine. Boring. Oh, we've only got 51 weeks till we can start again. <laughs> I understand this. <clears throat> If you're not saved okay because if you're not saved that Christmas break and and all the parties and and the gifts and and the things that go on the sales um, you know that that whole thing has a defined end okay um, when Christmas is done and the new year is begun and the old year is wrapped up, you're, you're back to just the, the grind and, and working toward paying off your credit card from the previous Christmas so you can charge it up again on the next one. If you're doing that, shame on you. Shame, shame. Okay? We'll talk about that next year because we're actually going to do a series on money. And I'm only going to do a little tiny bit on tithes and offerings. Okay? Did you know that, that money is one of the most discussed topics in the Bible? It is mentioned over 1,000 times. And yet all we ever hear in church is, pay your tithes, pay your tithes, pay your tithes. And occasionally, 
give to the missionary, give to the evangelist, give to the needy. Okay, we'll, we'll touch those things, but I want to address all that the Bible has to say about money because as Christians, we are incredibly, incredibly ignorant of what God's will concerning money is. And we don't really even understand that God has a plan for money and a use for it, okay? Um, but backing up, taking, I'm, I'm taking my segue back to the road. For a non-Christian, the season is done, the humdrum is beginning, but as Christians, shouldn't this be the norm? The, the joy and the peace and the excitement of Christmas, shouldn't that be normative for us? Shouldn't that be our normal behavior? You see, as Christians, we're looking to the birth of Christ, and, and just a little tidbit of history for you. It wasn't until, uh, I believe it was about uh, 1200 AD, that the church really started pushing Christmas. And the reason they started pushing Christmas, the birth of Christ, is because they started developing within the church this idea that Jesus was not human, that he was just God, and even to the idea that he wasn't even tangibly a person, that he was spirit, which, which blows my mind, because you look at all the places where he touched people, and they touched him. I need your hand. Finger. <laughs> okay? So when, when I read these false doctrines and these false theologies that came out that Jesus was not even, you know, I go, whoa. How can you get that out of there? That was a hard poke, man. <laughs> so the church started pushing the idea, the understanding, the truth, that God became flesh. He, the incarnation, God became flesh, became man, and had all the same things that we have. Hunger, bathroom needs, body odor. He had everything that we do, every temptation that we have faced, he faced. Okay? <clears throat> and, but then something strange started happening. And it, it, it kind of sprung up in the late 1700s, and it really gave birth in the, the early 1900s. All of a sudden, Christmas became more important than Good Friday. And that, that's a new concept in the church. And it became more important than Resurrection Sunday. And it got to the point where um, I, I, I had to laugh. I was looking at some pictures. I have a lot of friends from high school on, on Facebook. And most of them, I just don't look at their posts. But I had one friend who was uh, pretty close to me in high school that is an atheist. And he's not just an atheist. He's an anti-Christian. And I thought it was really funny because he posted a number of pictures of his family celebrating Christmas. <laughs> he should call it debtmas. Because that's all it is. You're, you're spending money to celebrate spending money. Look, I, could, I can buy you something. I mean, he's completely opposed to the idea of Christ. He's completely opposed to the idea of God. And yet, he jumps right in to the celebration of the birth of Christ. <laughs> and, and honestly, guys, it doesn't offend me when somebody says, Happy Holidays, instead of Merry Christmas. You know why? Holy. That's exactly right. Because Happy Holidays, you're saying Happy Holy Day. Uh, I think it's an absolutely appropriate thing to think that Jesus' birth was holy. I'm okay with that. Doesn't bother me. Okay? Uh, when they say... Uh, Yippee Kwanzaa. Uh, what did you say? Happy Kwanzaa or Merry Kwanzaa? Or I don't know what the, the proper etiquette is for that. I, I don't even understand it. Okay? Um, but that's okay. You know, you, you celebrate Kwanzaa Mass. 
or whatever, okay? But the idea is they don't have to celebrate what I'm celebrating, especially when they don't understand who I'm celebrating, okay? Don't, don't get offended at that. Quit confusing your Christianity with your Americananity, okay? The two are not one. And although they used to walk a very much closer path previously, there is only one time God ever chose a nation to be his. And it wasn't America. It was Israel. Okay? We belong to a nation that supersedes national boundaries. We are a holy nation. And before you get all cocky about belonging to this holy nation, Peter also calls us a peculiar people. Okay. I, I love how God brings us up and levels us out. Okay. So, as Christians, we are not looking at just the birth of a, another baby. We're looking at the Messiah, who was born as a baby. Okay? We are looking at the Lord of all come to earth, not just another birth. We're looking at God incarnate, not just another birth. December 25th is an arbitrarily picked date. It was actually chosen by the church to shift the focus from another celebration. Okay? And, and it was a, a pagan holiday, and the church took it and made it its own. Now, before you get all excited about this stuff, okay? Halloween, oh, the festival of Samhain. You know, the church is, is really, this is a day dedicated. What day is not God's? Please? What day is not holy unto him? Paul tells us, it doesn't matter whether you celebrate the Sabbath or the new moon feast. Celebrate unto God. I can take any day of the year and make it holy unto God because he's what makes it holy. And I can celebrate it. So don't get all uptight about, oh, why December 25th? He wasn't born on December 25th. No, he wasn't. Most likely. Most likely he was born sometime in September. I've heard dates even as early as July. Christmas in July. Who wants to do that with sweat? <laughs> A lot of people, they live in places like Hawaii. <laughs> 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 And sharks. <laughs> but as Christians, we celebrate the birth of our Savior. We celebrate a chance at a new life, a new creation, a new relationship with God. Because the status quo is enmity. The status quo for humanity with God, they're enemies. Okay? Don't get this idea that, oh, we're good people. Bull. Poopy. There is no such thing as good apart from Christ. Christ even said that only God is good. So when we look at Christmas, we're looking at the celebration of the start of something huge. We're looking at a paradigm shift where the status quo does not have to be enmity. We're looking at 
the possibility of being included into the family of God. Do you understand that? Do you understand the significance of that little statement? You can be part of the family of God. I had the privilege of going to um, the official adoption of, uh, for, for those of you that remember him, Paul and Sherry Cabrera. And, and they adopted Sadie. And it was a, I, I tell you, I, I know there is a God by how he sustained Paul and Sherry through that whole process. But we got to go in and, and we got to stand before the judge as he said, that, okay, this adoption is official. Sadie is now a part of your family. And he, he said some incredible things. He said, you take the responsibility of her life just as you would a natural born child. And you will be her parents and she is your daughter. There is now a relationship where there wasn't one before. And those of us that were there, we're, we're talking all the way out how incredible, how much we emulate God without realizing it. Because we are adopted into the family of God. So this season that we're, we're wrapping up really is never wrapped up. It, it, it's, it's ongoing. Ongoing. And then this one time of the year, the world that does not know God gets a little glimpse of what we have ongoing. And so when we come to the end of Christmas and the end of this holiday season, it should never be, it should you be, yeah, let the party continue. I'm not a party dude, okay? Um, I, uh, Christmas Eve at our house was loud. I, I, I get nervous around loud. Okay, I don't go to loud events. Uh, I went to one concert in my life. It was loud. <laughs> and I couldn't even understand what they were singing because everybody was so loud. And I don't understand the point of going to a concert and not be able to hear the concert. But Christmas Eve was loud and there was <laughs> happiness and there was joy and there was cheer and there was cheating at Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but we had a festive time. And then Christmas Day, it was calm. And, and there was not the noise, but there was still this, this deep sense of, of contentment. And, and I'm, I'm very much a family person, okay? I will choose family before just about any other event, if given the choice, okay? And my family has grown to the point, and, and there have been, you know, four of the five are married, and they have other families that, that they're obligated to go and do stuff with, just like, you know, their spouses are obligated to come to my house. And so Christmas Day, it was quiet because they all went to their other families. And that was okay. Because it was just uh, Josh and Mackenzie were there in the morning and then they went over to the divorce. And I saw the pictures there. They looked like they had fun. I still don't understand the, the waltzing in front of the tree and why Josh, his face was covered by Nick's hand. But, um, you know, there are stories to be told. But it was Christy and Thaddeus and I. and, the, and I was not looking forward to Christmas because each year it seems like, you know, another one leaves and, and Christmas gets smaller and smaller. But this year there was just this sense of peace. And I, I preached several weeks in a row about keeping the focus of Christmas what it is. And I think God honored that in me as I was seeking to keep him first in the celebration. I think he honored that. Now, you've got your Bibles. I told you to bring them out. Flip open to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look there real quick, okay? <clears throat> because this is what Christianity should look like. 
okay? And as we wrap up this holiday season, this is what our lives should continue to be like. Now keep in mind, I, I preached an entire series on this passage, and I, I wanna stress to you a couple of things before we read. First, this is not measurable from person to person. That's not the idea here, okay? So when I go through this list, you can't look and go, oh yeah, I'm way up compared to Joe, or I'm way down compared to Joe. Okay, you can't look that way. Because some of us excel in some areas, and others excel in other areas. What you need to compare yourself to is where you are now versus where you were before. Okay, that's the only comparison that needs to happen. And if you want to be really cocky about it, the only example that we have to compare ourselves to is the perfection of all of this, which is Jesus Christ. That alone should keep you humble. Okay? The second thing is, it's not you that does this. It's God's Spirit that does this. Okay? So don't go, I'm never going to get there. Yeah, you will. God's Spirit takes you there. And it's an ongoing process. That's why when we compare, we compare to where we were. So we can mark the growth in our walk, in our lives. All right, so Galatians chapter five. This is what is the normal Christian life, what it should look like, okay? Give me a minute to flip over there real quick. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start in verse 18. Okay, there's a huge contrast that comes here. And, and what we're going to see, hopefully what we'll see, is how the world is after Christmas, after all the, the festivities have stopped. We see examples of this listed, and hopefully it's not us being described here. Then we're going to see uh, the example of how the Christian should be responding, okay? So Paul is writing and he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay, so I want to back up. I just want to hit a couple of key points really quickly here. First, don't feel like You've blown it if you have fallen into one of these descriptions of the works of the flesh. Keep in, in mind, these are examples. This list is not all-inclusive, okay? Because you can look through this list and go, <laughs> uh, no, not into sorcery. Okay? We, we each struggle in different areas, okay? And I, I want to encourage you with a, a little bit of hope if you're struggling with a particular area. Because you're struggling with a particular area does not mean that you're not a Christian. Because if you weren't a Christian, the Spirit would not be prompting you to struggle with this thing. You would just do it with reckless abandon. Okay? The fact that you're struggling is a good indicator that you've got the Spirit of God living in you, prompting you, stop, don't do that. 
you need to lay that down. Hey, you! Quit! That's, well, that's how he speaks to me. Okay? Because I'm really good at tuning out the soft voices. Okay? So, first thing is, these are lists, are examples. They're not intended to be all-inclusive. But then, um, you know, I, I look at some of these and I look at how the world... Have you watched any of the videos of the, you know, Black Friday sales? Good Lord. Good Lord. And then, all those things they fought for to get at a good price and then they gave to someone? And the day after Christmas, they're taking it back? You risk life and limb for that? But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what our lives should look like ongoing, increasingly. Now again, let me remind you, this is not you that does this. It's the Spirit living in you. It's the Spirit that is growing you and is changing you. Okay? We, it's like looking at that seed. You look at the seed and you go, uh, okay, it's just a, you know, look at a kernel of corn that's just sticking the ground. It's hard. It's, it looks like it's dead. There's nothing there. You dig a hole, you put it in the ground, and you cover it, and you water it, and you let God do the work, and God brings forth a stalk of corn. And it reproduces after its own kind. That's the way our lives should work according to Scripture. God takes what is dead, he buries it, and we have that representation through baptism, and then he brings it forth new, and it grows, and then it reproduces. Okay? So this is what we should have in increasing measure. Love, and this is agapeo, okay? This is unconditional. It's not based on whether or not they deserve it, okay? God loves you even though you were and sometimes are unworthy of being loved. The love is based on the giver, not on the receiver. Okay? Unconditional love. Joy. This is not happy, happy, happy. Okay? This is understanding that in the chaos that is going on around you, and, and quite honestly, in the last month, we have had a lot of chaos going on in the families in this church. We have had more health issues in the last uh, four, five, six weeks than we've had in the entire three years at any one time that, since I've been a pastor. And, and yet I'm watching as, as these people are responding to these, these crises, and I'm watching as God is growing them. And, and I've heard over and over and over again people saying, I can't do it. Yeah, you can't. That's probably why God put you in that place, so you could see him do it. Okay? So, joy, understanding him, says in the presence of the Lord is Fullness of joy. Peace. That doesn't mean, peace does not mean necessarily quiet. Okay? You can have peace in the midst of loud, chaotic things. I felt that Christmas Eve. as grandchildren were running around, hyped up on candy canes and every other kind of sugar that Grandma and I stuffed in their stockings, and their parents weren't paying close enough attention as Grandma and Grandpa were sneaking them more. We can do that because we know they're going home in a little while. <laughs> Kids come out with a glass of water in their little sippy cup. Papa takes it and dumps it and puts soda. <laughs> I didn't do Mountain Dew this time. <laughs> and my grandchildren love Manga and Papa. <laughs> and they stand there fighting. <laughs> but in the midst of all that was going on, and it, it's so funny because our children have grown up, they're mature, 
They have jobs, they have families, they have responsibilities, and they come in my house and they immediately revert back to being like 12. <laughs> so I, I love it. I love the fact that my entire family can get together and act goofy and silly and do weird things. Okay? Because if they didn't do that, I would be going, well, what is wrong with you? But in the midst of all that chaos, Christy and I both had peace. <clears throat> Patience. Not letting things run you. Letting God run you. Because life is going to throw you curves. Being patient. Waiting on God to accomplish what he has said he will accomplish. Kindness. Kindness. You know, that's something that I, I see increasingly or, or perhaps decreasingly. But less and less I see kindness. Just, just the simple kindnesses. Um, I'll tell you one of the things that chaps me when I'm out in public is when I see a man fling the door to the store open and walk through and there's a woman behind him or, or an, an older person. One of the other things that really chaps me is when I see a couple out at a restaurant and one or the other of them is talking on their phone. Put the dead blame thing down and communicate with the person you're there with. Just put it away. We were at Taco Bell, which is not infrequent. <laughs> and I was watching, there was a, a young couple came in and this guy from the time he came in the door, he was doing this. <clears throat> And they walk up. Uh, number two. <laughs> I wanted to slap him. <laughs> not, not because. He was necessarily on the phone, but because sitting across the table from him was this beautiful young lady that chose to be with him in that moment, at that restaurant, at that table, over that food. I use that term loosely. Okay? And he's completely ignoring her. Dude. Kindness. When somebody's talking to you, stop and listen. Don't just pause thinking about what you're going to say next. Listen. Engage them. Hear what they're saying. Goodness. Do we have enough goodness or do we ration it? We hold that goodness for a key time. How often was Jesus good? Always. Was he good when he let the rich young ruler walk away? Yeah, he, he was doing a good thing because he understood that that man did not want what he thought he wanted. I, I, I want to I, I be saved. I wanna, what, what, what must I do to inherit life? Well, you, you obey the law. I obey the law. And Jesus looked into his heart and he saw where he was caught, what was holding him, what had trapped him. And he told him very clearly how to get out of that trap. But that young man wanted to stay in that trap. He had gold bars, but they were bars nonetheless. Faithfulness. Can people trust you? When you say you're going to do something, do people roll their eyes? Or do they know that it's going to get done? Can people trust you in church? Can they trust you with things? And not just like physical material, but can they trust you with you 
if I share something with you, can I trust you with it? Or are you going to take it and, and do something wrong? Or are you going to do something hurtful? Are you faithful? Gentleness. That's kind of a, a, an interesting one, especially in America, especially in Montana, where men are taught to be men. <laughs> you guys do it, you know. I'll tell you what, we bagged our first elk this year. <laughs> and it was Christy that did it. <laughs> but it was my truck. <laughs> so now I can go <clears throat> with all the hunters. <laughs> well, no, I really can't because she actually <clears throat> did the deed. <laughs> Gentleness. Think about Christ and his ministry on earth. Think about how many times he pulled the children to him and he picked them up and he held them and he used them as examples. Think about how his heart broke when talking with Mary and Martha and, and going to see Lazarus and, and knowing that he was going to raise him from the dead and yet knowing that, that uh, I think when he wept there, he was weeping for the grieving with the people that were there, but I think he knew what was going to happen to him. He was not doing a good thing for Lazarus. Lazarus was getting ready to receive his reward. He was bringing him back knowing that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were going to persecute him and ultimately kill him. Think about how he wept when he looked out over Jerusalem as he was coming in. And he longed to bring them unto salvation. And he looked just a few years down the road, knowing that Rome was going to destroy that city, and he was going to, Rome would slaughter the men, the women, and the children. And he looked, and he saw, and he knew. Self-control. Now that's a weird thing to talk about after we've celebrated Thanksgiving and Christmas. <coughs> And, you know, we put on the holiday pounds and we're looking to making New Year's resolutions to remove those pounds before we add more in the next holiday season. Self-control. Choosing how you will act instead of just responding. This is the normal Christian life. This is what we should be increasingly in. Okay, when it comes to Christmas, really we're in our natural environment. This should be where we are all year long. Not here for a little while and then gone. This should be ongoing, ongoing, increasingly. Remember, we, the, it's increasingly, not perfectly. So when you look at these things, because I, I, every time I read this list, I go, Ooh. Because I can think of examples where I have ditched every one of these. Increasingly, not perfectly, allowing God's Spirit to work in you the Christ-like nature that He has called us to. So that ultimately, it's more of Him, less of me. Until ultimately it becomes Him and not me. And I can be just as He was. No, I'm not saying I'm going to have olive skin and I'm going to wear Jewish clothing from the turn of the millennia. I'm not talking about that. The nature that I have in me will be exactly like Christ wants it to be, exactly the way that he is. Okay? Father, I bless you this morning and I thank you that you are good to us. And Father, as, as we celebrate your birth, we even more celebrate that you chose to die in our place. God, that you chose that you would take all of your wrath and pour it out on your son. That the price would be paid. 
the sentence would be met and that we could stand before you absolutely righteous with your righteousness, not our own. And Father, we celebrate because you have given us your spirit that leads us, that guides us, that convicts us, that changes us, that grows us. And you have set us in the body of Christ with other believers that can help us along the way, that can stand beside us, that can shield us in the fight. We thank you that you know so well everything that we need and you've put everything into place to make sure that those needs are met. We thank you that everything good in our life comes from you. And we bless you this morning, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>